everybody. Welcome to Muscle Maven Radio. I'm your host, Ashley Van Houten. Thank you so much for being here. As always, I appreciate you listening and tuning in every week. This week's episode is about fasting, uh, specifically for women. And I think that's important because um, we often hear that fasting is something that is either more complicated for women, less effective for women, maybe outright a bad idea. Um, but we often don't hear about why, right? Like you get some like vague ideas of like, well, it's because our hormones are more complicated or because we aren't meant to go without food and guys can kind of get away with it or like, you know, just sort of generic kind of explanations without a lot of science behind it. And I know that fasting has a lot of benefits for a lot of people. I know that a lot of women are interested in it, and I know that a lot of women um, are trying it and struggling, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you want to give up on it. And I like to think, because I've played a little bit with fasting myself, I like to think that similar to many other approaches like carnivore resets or the keto diet or whatever, I see them more as tools that you can add to your knowledge and your toolbox and use if and when appropriate and when it works for you and when it uh, aligns with your goals. Um, I don't think that everyone needs to fast. I don't think that everyone needs to fast the same way. Um, and I think that women can absolutely achieve a desired body composition and health without fasting. Um, but I also think it's worth exploring these things. And I think it's worth just challenging our notion too of, um, what it means to fast or not, because I think that we also have a culture these days where we're kind of set up to eat all the time. And so we look at going 15 hours a day without eating as some extreme thing, when it's really not. Um, and so we put this label on it, like intermittent fasting, that makes it seem like this sexy or weird or different thing, when really it's like, we're not supposed to be eating every few hours around the clock, right? So I think it's cool to just talk about this stuff again in like a nuanced way, have some experts weigh in on the subject, and also just get some questions answered about why it can be more complicated for women to fast, um, how we can approach it in a better way, a more educated and informed way, um, when it may not be a good idea to fast, when it may be a good idea. Um, and this episode, of course, is for men too, because most of this stuff really is going to apply across the board. Um, some of it is specific to women for sure, but if you have anyone in your life, a woman who's looking at trying to fast or maybe having some issues with it, you can help her out. This is great for people who are coaches um, who work with women that inevitably are going to come up against this and, and are going to have maybe a bit more information. So um, this is helpful for everybody. And I brought on today an expert, Cynthia Thurlow. She um, is a nutrition educator, nurse practitioner, and an expert on fasting. So we're going to talk all about that stuff. Um, She's fantastic. She's just coming out with a new book. So you definitely want to check her out. I'll put all of her information in the show notes. But just before we get into it, it's been a while since I read out a review and I wanted to do that because I really, really appreciate when you guys leave me podcast reviews. It means a lot. It's like the only feedback that I get that... I mean, matters if I'm being honest. So because it helps other people see it and helps other people see the podcast. So Anyone who takes the time to post an actual thoughtful review, it is incredibly meaningful to me. Um, and this one is a fun recent one from btara00. She says, the podcast is a wealth of knowledge and keeps it real. One of my favorite podcasts. Ashley has so much knowledge to share, always has great guests, and especially love the episodes with Rachel Gregory. Yay! Rachel is the best. She's essentially my co-host at this point. You may know that uh, Rachel and I have created an entire program called Muscle Science for Women, um, that we will be starting up our second intake of that program um, after the summer. So if you want to know more about that, send me a message. Anyway, back to the review. You keep it real and make me laugh, all while continuing to learn about how I can optimize my health and build some muscles. Keep up the great work and sharing if of all of your favorite products as well. Awesome. That is very nice of you. I appreciate it. I'm glad that you're laughing. 
I really try to be as entertaining as I possibly can on here. So that means a lot. Um, if this is your review, please send me a message on Instagram at the muscle maven, or you can send me an email through my website, ashleyvanhouten.com. And I will get you either an autographed cookbook, or I will get you, uh, one of my, um, t-shirts that's on the website. It's the, uh, ice cream, it takes guts t-shirt, whichever one you want. So send me a message. I appreciate you. I appreciate everyone for listening. Enough of my rambling. Here is my chat with Cynthia Thurlow, all about fasting. All right, Cynthia, we are recording. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I appreciate you taking the time so much. Welcome. Thank you so much. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Me too. We were just saying offline, we've got um, a lot of very impressive female friends in common. So mm-hmm. I, uh, I feel very good about where this podcast is going to go. Um, Absolutely. Before we dive into, I've got a couple kind of big general questions that I, I want to kind of start with, and then you can um, mm-hmm. help us dive into the details. But maybe if you um, wouldn't mind sharing with our listeners a little bit about, um, I've introduced you already and, and folks know who you are, but but maybe just kind of what you're working on these days, what's sort of exciting you these days um, now that we're just into summer 2021. Yeah, no. Well, I would say first and foremost, I'm I'm just excited that I feel like there's some degree of semi-normalcy returning to our lives. Mm-hmm. My family and I, I have two teenage boys and a husband and two crazy doodles and a crazy lizard in our house. And I think, you know, we're wanderlusters. We love to travel. And so actually in two days, we're getting on a plane to Montana. I have my first public speaking gig in like 16 months. So I would say that's number one. Number two is I just submitted my manuscript for my book, which is talking about women in intermittent fasting. And we know that uh, we're not many men. So that's exciting to know that that's coming. I think my, my editor told me yesterday that the planned launch is March of 2022, which seems like really far ahead, but (laughs) given the past 16 months, I'm like, I'll take it. I'm totally fine with that. And then I would say, lastly, we are actually relocating. We are in the Washington DC area. We're actually relocating, uh, building a home in another part of the state. And I'm excited to just do something different. I think on so many levels, uh, the pandemic, COVID, social distancing, I think for a lot of people, and I was talking to my family about this last night at dinner, either brought people closer together because you're like, I really love my family and I really am grateful for my family or people have just said, you know, this is not working for me, irrespective of the woods. Exactly. <laughs> Well, we feel like we've been out on like, I think everyone, because they've been so socially isolated, I think far too many people are probably feeling like, you know, it's been a, it's been a frenetic last 16 months. So, you know, for us, we're relocating to a little quieter part of the state, a little less drama, and we're really excited about that. So that's, you know, lots of things to look forward to uh, a lot of flux, but I think given the last 16 months, I'm like, if everyone comes out as a better human being, then it served its purpose. Absolutely. I mean, and I think what you touched on there too, whether you're, you're sort of enhancing relationships or figuring out what you don't Mm -hmm. want in your life. The key there is that we're like clarifying some things. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm having lots of conversations with friends, um, these days and maybe more in the latter part of this experience where people are like, I really had no choice, but to just face whatever Mm -hmm. was going on for better or worse and, and get through it. Um, so I think that that clarification, like I've, I know so many people who are moving, like they're moving because they're just like, I, I've spent so much time here now that I get what I don't like about this place or whatever. And so, you know, moving on to different spots. So that is a lot. That's very exciting. Okay. Let's talk about the big subject that I would love for you to illuminate us about is fasting, but we're talking fasting for women specifically, Mm -hmm. because I've touched on this a little bit in, in the podcast before, but it's very difficult to find fasting information that is directed Mm -hmm. to women. Generally speaking, most of us know at this point that if we're talking about health studies, fitness studies, nutrition Mm -hmm. studies, unless specified, they're usually done on male subjects. They're Mm -hmm. done with sort of male physiology in mind. Um, And we know that, and I think that like, there's, there's a lot of nuance here about, like you said, like we're not kind of mini men. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's difficult sometimes too, because we don't want to differentiate ourselves so much that it's like, 
men are from Mars, women are from Venus, we're completely different creatures, nothing's the same, because that's also not accurate. Mm -hmm. Um, But we have, we do have different physiology, we do have Mm -hmm. different hormones and and things going on, they're going to make us potentially react differently to different um, diets or approaches. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'd love for you to maybe just start high level by talking, if you if you can, a little bit about your book and why you why you wrote it Mm -hmm. and some of the kind of key concepts that you're going to cover, and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah. And and so thank you for that. I I think that there are a lot of people that fear monger about fasting in women and there's a lot of misinformation. In fact, when I was starting to do, write the book and I created a coaching program that goes along with it. So I've got women in a coaching program as I'm writing the book, um, trying to explain to them that most of the research that's been done is done in rodent models or animal models. So that's number one. And last time I checked, we are not rodents or small mammals. Uh, number two, obviously, you can't make the same connection between women and men in, with generalities because the fact that we get a menstrual cycle when we're in our fertile years differentiates us tremendously. What I do find interesting is that the bulk of the research that's been done on women has really been done in obese menopausal women, which is a totally separate. I always I think of women in two buckets, like you're still getting your period or you're not. And so the people who are still getting their period, there is so much nuance. There is so much to unpack when it, as it pertains to intermittent fasting. And those individuals have to be a little bit more attuned, careful, conscientious. And then women that are no longer getting their periods, they don't have to worry about as much hormonal fluctuation, but it doesn't mean that there, again, isn't a degree of nuance and appreciation. So probably about six years ago, I, uh, in the course of one week, and this is kind of how I... If I'm thinking about doing something new or unusual, I have to have heard it from a couple different people. And so in one week span of time, I think it was a colleague, a nutritionist friend, a fitness person that mentioned intermittent fasting. And so my typical fashion, I have to go read a lot about it. And I read Jason Sfong, Complete Guide to Fasting, which I think of as a fasting Bible. It's really great information. There's a lot of incredible resources as well as contributors, You know, some of the biggest people in like the paleo, keto fasting, low carb community contributed to that book. And so I then felt validated as, you know, an allopathic trained traditional Western medicine trained MP that I was like, okay, now I can actually, you know, I can sink my teeth into this literally. Like I feel comfortable knowing that there's a lot of good research. And so started practicing, started feeling better almost immediately for anyone that's listening. That's a a, a nearly middle-aged person and middle age is really like North of, you know, 38, 40 years old, um, I was starting to notice some changes with my body and almost instantaneously, I started feeling better. And, you know, the body composition piece, of course, came a little bit later, but from that, I started attracting a certain tribe of women and I started using intermittent fasting as a strategy with them. I started seeing um, a lot of success. And then I was actually doing a lot of troubleshooting without even realizing it. I started to kind of create an algorithm of, you know, how can you teach this effectively how can you teach it systematically? And how can you account for all this bioindividuality? Because a 35-year-old woman fasting is very different than a 45-year-old versus a 60-year-old. And it doesn't mean that any of them cannot fast. Or I have a couple like hard and fast rules. But kind of from that, from those experiences, I created a program called IF45. And so that's really the basis of the book is like a 45-day program that you know women can you know, walk themselves through very safely that gives them challenges, gives them a lot of support, and then gives them actionable things that they can do. It's not fluff. There's actually substance in the book. And so that's actually the basis of the book. And then I think the other piece is, um, so I created this program and then I I did a talk um, two years ago. Uh, Ironically, I decided to do a TED talk initially because I'm an introvert and I wanted to do something scary. And the thought of getting on a stage and committing something to memory was terrifying. And so I was like, I need to do this. This is a safe kind of challenge. And so I got one talk and then I got a second. I remember saying to my husband and for anyone who's listening, he's not familiar with TED talks. You can't do a talk on the same subject. So my first talk was on the uber sexy topic of perimenopause, which is the five to seven years preceding menopause. And then I did a talk on a strategy that I knew a lot about because I had to make a quick decision. And I said to my husband, I have to give him credit for this. What do I know a lot about? And he was like, intermittent fasting. I was like, okay, I'm going to do my second talk on intermittent fasting. And and that was kind of 
the beginning of a, a, a complete trajectory shift in my business. And so I did that talk. And then um, obviously that program got really fine tuned very quickly. And I've had, it's about, you know, if you're a clinician seeing, you know, 15, 20 patients a day, being able to be an entrepreneur and be able to impact more lives to me is really the trajectory I kind of see my, my business going in. And so that, that's where it started from. And from there, you know, I, I got a book deal and that was a really exciting process. As I know you've been through that yourself, mm -hmm. um, really exciting, you know, next step. So that, that's the, the kind of interworkings of how that came about. Okay. Thank you. I'd love to know how you were eating and feeling before you dove into intermittent fasting, because similar to you, I like to just kind of try things and use mm -hmm. myself as a guinea pig and experiment. And I don't always do it. I'm fortunate that I don't always have to do these things, um, like have to do them for health mm -hmm. reasons. I do them to, to learn and, and mm -hmm. kind of have the experience. Um, so I've played around with fasting as well, but what were there any challenges that you were looking to address and yeah, how were you eating kind of before you started playing with it? Um, I had been gluten-free at 40. I just decided that, um, you know, for a challenge, I'm going to go gluten-free and I actually cleared an autoimmune disease that I had had since being treated for Lyme. So prior to fasting, I was doing um, some grains, some dairy, uh, largely you know meat focused vegetables. I've always been a healthy eater, but I think as I've gotten older, I've had to pull more things away. Like, and that's kind of the it, it depends on how you want to frame it. I look at it as I feel good, and and pulling these things out is not a hardship as opposed to this kind of scarcity mindset. So uh, that's where I was when I started intermittent fasting. But you know prior to that. I was never, I was never an unhealthy eater. I was always exercising and doing all the right things, but I think on, you know, many levels, uh, the whole concept of mini meals and snacks, you know, I used to go to the, I would go to the gym in the morning and then I would go to the hospital. I would shower at the gym and I would have like the protein shake before and the protein shake after. And then I'd have like a bunch of snacks. I bring all these Pyrex dishes, uh, to the office and, or in clinic and I think about it now and I'm like, God, I was constantly having to eat because I was hungry all the time. And I think the beauty of uh, the whole fasting process is you realize like, that's not the way our bodies are designed to be that when you restack your macros and stop snacking and allow your body to burn fat inside, you know, the intrinsic uh, fat in our bodies, as opposed to eating copious amounts of fat, that's a really pivotal kind of mindset shift that people experience. So that's where it started from, but I was never like a standard American diet, couch potato kind of girl. But I think with, you know, every iteration throughout my lifetime, I definitely went from saying, Oh, okay, well, like there's 20 or 30 grams of sugar in this organic Greek yogurt. That's got that's sugar sweetened. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Like you just start of, it's kind of like peeling an onion, you peel back another layer and you recognize that you can do a little better and then you get results and you're like encouraged to do a little more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, you did mention too, that there are some maybe hard and fast rules in terms of the, the few, maybe a relatively few mm -hmm. who should not be fasting, but I'd love for you to touch on that, but also maybe talk about why it is that I think that one of the main kind of um, narratives with fasting in women tends to be, um, that it could be problematic, that it doesn't mm -hmm. work the same for women, that it's harder for women, that women's bodies don't respond to it the same mm -hmm. way. And, but there's never any kind of follow-up like, but here's why this may not be working as well. Right. Or here's, here are the things you may be doing wrong for yourself, mm -hmm. for your body, for your physiology. So maybe if you could start by, by talking about these hard and fast rules of people who just maybe should not be mm -hmm. bothering with fasting right now and then talk about why it is that that there is that sort of common mainstream narrative that like it just doesn't work as well for women yeah yeah and those are great questions and, and certainly ones that i'm sure your listeners will appreciate getting some feedback on so my hard and fast rules are if you're pregnant breastfeeding or trying to conceive not the time and, and this is something that i find personally really upsetting. It, you know, I granted I was pregnant a long time ago. I have a 15 year old and 13 year old, but when we are pregnant and when we are breastfeeding, our body requires a bit more macronutrients, calories, whatever you want to focus on. And to think that you're going to restrict 
in order to get the benefits from fasting, the only person you're ultimately hurting um, is your baby. And so for me, I, I think that that's, that's a hard and fast no. I know there's a lot of um, fit pros that I see on social media who suggest otherwise, and they very proudly stand there and they talk about, you know, they breastfeed all day long and then they're also fasting. And I'm like, I was so hungry when I was breastfeeding, I could have eaten, I could have eaten like an entire grocery store. So I cannot imagine trying to restrict your macros. Um, so that's number one. I think about people that have a disordered relationship with food, binge eating, anorexia, bulimia, especially the anorexics, it can really, really trigger. I get messages all over social media every day from binge eaters that really still struggle. Of course, there are always exceptions. And I will say to people, if they reach out to me, you need to be working with an eating disorder specialist while if you decide you want to do this to make sure you're not triggering um, feelings of either binging or restrictive behavior. Next, I think about people that um, are underweight to begin with, and you would be surprised, you know, if someone's got a BMI less than 18, you're pretty thin to begin with. You shouldn't be restricting your, your food intake or someone that's recently been hospitalized. I know when I was hospitalized in 2019, I didn't fast for months because I had lost so much weight. Um, and I'm very open about that. I also think that if you've got like a chronic health condition, one that you, you know, you have to see a, a physician or a nurse practitioner or a PA regularly, you probably want to touch base with them. It doesn't mean that it's not uh, a foreseeable option, but if you're on blood pressure medications, diabetes medications, et cetera, you need to be touching base with someone so that they can monitor those things to make sure you don't need adjustments in your medications. And really beyond that, you know, I, I made the mistake in my Ted talk of saying, you know, um, saying people over the age of 70. And then of course there are a bunch of very healthy people over the age of 70 that can safely fast. But I usually say, if you're frail, certainly children and teenagers are still growing not a good strategy. They're better to go low carb. I get that question quite a bit as well. You know, can we safely do this? And I said, if you're still growing, no, if you stop growing, then yes. So if you stop growing and you're 18 years old and you're doing this in conjunction with a knowledgeable healthcare provider, I don't see any reason why not to, but I have boys and boys continue to grow into their early twenties. So I just say, you know, hold off. It's better off making dietary nutritional tweaks first before even considering something like that. And when it comes to women, I suspect a lot of the concerns, and this is not unprecedented. This happens in a lot of medical research that the amount of variables that have to be taken into account when we're looking at women with uh, getting their menstrual cycle are just so vast that people do not want to take the time to have to monitor, are they in their luteal phase? Are they in their follicular phase? You know, uh, are they in their ovulatory phase? What are we going to do if we muck things up? You know, sometimes people get benefits just from doing 12 hours a day of not eating. And that's pretty easy. But the, the average American, I think you'll find this surprising. Average American consumes a sugar sweetened beverage or eats food 16 to 17 times a day. So if you think about it, just giving your body some digestive rest is hugely beneficial. And so I think, like I stated earlier, I think a lot of the fear mongering about women is because we poorly understand how our bodies respond to fasting. There's so much bioindividuality. You really have to be careful around, um, you know, when you're getting your menstrual cycle as to whether or not you can or can't fast, you have to adjust your macros. And then the other piece is, you know, it's the lifestyle stuff. You know, if you aren't sleeping, you're working out way too hard. I mean, how many women listening have gone through a period of time? I've been guilty of this myself where we work out harder and not smarter. And so, you know, if the lifestyle piece isn't dialed in, irrespective of what life stage you're in as a woman, you're not going to be successful with fasting. So there's just a lot of moving pieces. Whereas men kind of, I always say my husband was a college athlete and he like effortlessly fasts every day, no problems, never has to worry about anything. You know, he's, um, he's incredibly fit for his age, especially for his age. And so I always laugh. I'm like, you would never know um, that this guy's the age he is. And it's because, you know, fasting for guys, it's just so much easier to do. Most things are so much more mm -hmm. simple for men. When they are physiology, really. Yeah. Um, to continue on this, this uh, conversation of like why it may not be working and why mm -hmm. it may be frustrating for women who are trying and not getting the results they want. Um, is it also accurate to say maybe because you touched on like for some people fasting or beginner fasting is just going 12 hours, just mm -hmm. like stopping eating at an yep. appropriate time, 
don't eat anything in the middle of the night, have breakfast yeah. at a normal time. Yeah. Um, but do you think sometimes it is kind of this like all or nothing approach where people yes. may be going from, yeah, standard American diet, mm-hmm. total sugar burner, eating all, you know, around the clock. Mm-hmm. And then you go from that to, I'm going to try fasting for 24 hours twice a week or something. And then you wonder why your body is kind of crashing and burning. Yeah. So, um, what are, what are some, general protocols you would recommend for women who are looking to get into this that don't have any experience with it Mm -hmm. to kind of gradually ease themselves in because we tend to have a hard time with that right like we like to be in the extremes we want to be all or nothing we have a hard time being patient and like trusting the process I think sometimes well I, I have to laugh because this morning someone on my team they kind of give me if they most of my team answers my questions on social media because they they know the answers. And every once in a while, I get an email with like 10 questions. These are the things we saw on social media. And of course, one of them was, I've been fasting for 16 days and I haven't lost a pound. And I think we are so hard on ourselves as women. You know, We want instantaneous results. We're frustrated when we don't get instantaneous results because we have been conditioned that we should be getting instantaneous results. And I tell people all the time, if you are losing more than a pound or two a week, it is not sustainable. And we've been conditioned that potions and pills and powders are going to fix us. And I have to tell people all the time, that's like the worst bit of advice that we have been provided with or or shown through whether it's social media or on TV ads or, you know, anywhere else you can see advertisements for products or, you know, you see celebrities or influencers. I use this term influencers um, peddling whatever company has offered them a bunch of money to say how much they love a product And so I I think that we do ourselves a disservice by not being patient. It's hard to be patient. And I remind people that even if you're not seeing, uh, you know, pounds reduced on the scale, you're still doing tremendously beneficial things uh, outside. I call them the non-scale victories. There's still so many non-scale victories. So if someone's new to the concept and, and maybe you're coming from a fairly healthy diet, like, or I was, or maybe you're doing three meals and two snacks. I always say snacking, if you need a snack in between a meal, it's a sign that your macros are wrong. And so I'm sure your very savvy listeners know macros are protein, fat, and carbs, but I remind people you start with the protein piece. And then, you know, if there's not fat in your meat, you add in a little bit of healthy fat. And then, you know, whether you've earned your carbs, lots of non-starchy vegetables. And so I find once people start tweaking their macros, you know, remove snacks, then tweak your macros, get your blood sugar stabilized before you even attempt to fast. Um, Even starting with 12 hours, I tell people all the time, there is no shame in a 12 or 14 hour fast. Mm -hmm. You don't get a medal because you kill yourself to try to do a 20 hour fast. I cannot tell you how many women in groups because um, the the program that I run like four times a year, we put challenges uh, every week for people that have been fasting for a while to kind of like take it to another level. And then the newbies freak out thinking like, oh my gosh, why can't I do? And I'm like, it's not FOMO. There should be no FOMO. Stay in your lane. You know, your own bio-individuality is really key here. And if your body's not ready to do that, um, you can binge. I mean, there's lots of, you know, kind of negative behaviors that can come out of that. So, you know, starting with the no snacking, then progressing to adjusting your macros and then really being gentle with your body. Some people do really well just starting with a 14, 15 hour fast and they're able to do that. But I remind people that you want to be in a position where you um, have success for four to six weeks before you progress to really ramping up those fasting muscles, meaning, you know, before you start trying out one of those exotic, and I say exotic, exotic in quotes, 24, 48 hour fasts, because you can set yourself up for disappointment if you're not able to properly do that. And so I think that's really smart. And, And it's interesting because I'm an advocate of something called clean fasting. And that means during your fast, you're not consuming fatty coffees, um, you know, what, you know, filtered water is great. Black coffee is great. If you feel like black coffee is too bitter, you can put salt in it. Honest to God, it makes a huge difference. Hmm. Just changes the flavor profile just enough. Bitter tea. So bitter means bitter. It does not mean sweet. This is not the time to pull out your celestial seasonings, you know, apple orchard, blah, blah, blah. Um, This is green tea. This is black tea. Yes, it takes a little bit of time to get adjusted to that. It's not a bad thing. And for there are people out there that are going from standard American diet, couch potato to fasting. And so they need a little bit of, I call it the training wheels. You pull out the training wheels and sometimes the training wheels might be, you might have a teaspoon of MCT oil in your coffee because that is the only way you can make it from um, the time you wake up to you know even getting to a 16 hour fast with the understanding that that MCT oil has uh, although processed differently than a lot of other fats, 
it's still, you're still consuming food. So you want to be cognizant of the fact if you're trying to lose weight, fatty coffees are not benefiting you. I see all these people that are like, oh, I had this bulletproof coffee and I got till two o'clock in the afternoon. And I was like, yes, you did. But at some point you have to rip off the Band-Aid and you need to be able to burn your intrinsic or endogenous fat as opposed to exogenous, meaning like bulletproof coffee or butter or whatever. You know, I, I laughed, there was a meme maybe it was on Instagram and it was someone like eating a stick of butter and they're like, I'm fasting. I'm like, no, you're not. But it was like this big stick of butter. So there's a lot of misconceptions that kind of go on, but that's a good place to start and being really attuned to how your body feels. And that's something, and I'm sure you probably see this as well, that women in particular, when they want something to work, gosh, darn it, it's going to work no matter what they're doing. And so, you know, they suddenly go from sleeping through the night to not sleeping through the night and their energy is crashing. And I tell people, if you can't sleep through the night, don't add in fasting. And if you are fat or you're sleeping fine, and then you start fasting and you stop sleeping through the night, then it's a sign that you need to change things. And if your energy is great before, and then it's terrible afterwards, it's a sign that you need to do something differently. And it's okay. If fasting doesn't work for you at a certain time in your life, um, you know, there, there's times in our lives and we shouldn't fast and that's totally okay. Yeah. Yeah. I am just nodding with everything you're saying because working with some of the women that I'm working with, again, I think some of it is just that we're so hard on ourselves and so mm -hmm. many people are perfectionists to a, a point that of course is dysfunctional and not helping them, mm -hmm. but we haven't quite recognized that yet. And another of, of the issues with the way fitness culture is portrayed on social media and online and, you know, marketing and stuff is that we do think that every new thing we should try because if it mm -hmm. works for somebody else, it should work for us. And if it doesn't, we're failing. Um, and so instead of thinking about like, okay, mm -hmm. well, maybe how could I adjust? Or maybe why isn't this working for me? You just like double down and go mm -hmm. harder and harder and ignore your body's signals. And that's yeah. kind of like one of the biggest challenges I see with women is that we don't give ourselves the credit or the permission to like, listen to what our, we're, our mm -hmm. brains and our bodies are really telling us to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's that, I mean, just having you say this on the podcast, I think will be helpful because every woman I can get on here who will just say yeah. that is going to be helpful for me. But, um, so another kind of part that I want to talk about here, because it's another point of contention that I have with some clients and, and women that I work with you mentioned, you know, fasting generally not ideal for people in growing phases. So mm -hmm. we're talking about young people, pregnant people. What about women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s who are actively looking to grow muscle? Mm -hmm. um, I get a lot of women um, clients who are who have picked up on the fact that looking good and fit and toned is less about being as skinny as possible and more right. about growing some healthy skeletal mm -hmm. muscle and then, you know, working on body composition. Um, but so often, again, because of this impatience factor, we want to be growing muscle while mm -hmm. we're losing fat, fastest way to do that fast, restrict calories, do these fasted workouts, um, and all this stuff. And I have some opinions on it, but I would love for you to, to talk about maybe what you've seen or, or what you think about women who are actively trying to build muscle, but still either want to, or looking into incorporating fasting as well. Well, I'm going to separate the 20 and 30 something women, you know, they're at peak bone mass, peak muscle mass for their, their lifetime, their basal metabolic rate is higher. Um, these are women that are still in their peak fertility years, you know, under age 35. And so I would not recommend if a woman is looking to build a lot of muscle in those years to fast more than once or twice a week. Like I really, I mean, I feel fervently about this, or if you're going to do it, you're not fasting for more than to look at that as fasting. It's just digestive rest. Um, we know that you do get a surge of growth hormone, especially around 1 a.m. Um, you know, growth hormone is so critically important. And we know generally women's testosterone levels, again, I'm making a generality, are usually higher in their 20s and 30s. So oftentimes a whole lot easier to build muscle, you know, to be in this anabolic phase. Um, these are definitely women that want to be getting in, you know, as Dr. Gabrielle Lyon talks a lot about one gram of protein per ideal pound of body weight. And so really critically important that they are getting that in. Um, had I known as much as I know now in my, my latter forties, I would have been much more proactive about building as much muscle as I could in my thirties. Cause in my forties, 
uh, it is definitely a little bit more challenging as our testosterone levels are starting to shift at estradiol, which is estrogen and progesterone. So 20 and 30 somethings, I don't like daily fasts unless you're just doing like a 12 or a 13 hour fast absolutely positively not fasting the week before your period, the five to seven days before your period, you physiologically need a little bit more macros, you know, maybe about 150, 200 calories at most, depending on how physically active you are. That's a time when your body is a little more insulin sensitive. You can actually consume, uh, you know, more starchy carbs, whether it's root vegetables, or if you tolerate grains, um, or you have some, you know, low glycemic berries, and then we're going to talk about perimenopause in their women in their forties and into their fifties. Um, you know, we start the, the, the muscle loss that women start to experience after the age of 40. I forget the percentage. I probably have it right now. It was probably committed to memory while I was writing the book, but now it's fallen out of my brain, but we really start to see, uh, this, this process of sarcopenia, which is this muscle loss with aging. It will happen unless you are doing everything you can to ensure that it doesn't. So um, I know that you're very savvy with, with this kind of information, but getting adequate protein, strength training, uh, making sure that you are taxing those muscles so that you continue to build and maintain. And what I typically see is women in twenties and thirties, generally speaking, um, it's a whole lot easier to maintain at that stage of life. They get into their forties, they get into perimenopause, they gain a little bit of weight, they freak out. And what they do is they restrict, they restrict calories and macros, and they start doing more cardio thinking that's going to be the the, the panacea for this weight gain. And it's all about hormones, you know, as the hormones are fluxing, then they start seeing changes in body composition. And so when I'm, when I'm working with people in their forties and fifties, the first thing we talk about is sleep because almost everyone has sleep disturbances. I wish I had appreciated how well I slept before I went into perimenopause because now, um, I actually take progesterone, which is the one thing that helps a whole lot with sleep for me. With that being said, um, absolutely positively, uh, in perimenopause and menopause, we are less stress resilient, um, as our ovaries are producing less progesterone, it puts a greater tax on our adrenal glands and, uh, that that's one issue. So we don't manage stress as well. We don't sleep as well. That's going to set us up in our bodies. It's all this hormonal regulation. So if we're not sleeping properly, we have blood sugar dysregulation, which impacts our appetite. You'll see a lot of women, their bodies are trying to make more estrogen. And so they gravitate towards, you know, high, you know, kind of high caloric, highly processed foods. See women saying, I have these crazy cravings. I'm not suggesting women that are younger don't get them too, but it seems to be, this is definitely a time when you'll see this ramp up. And so stress, sleep, um, you know, the hormone piece, how regulated are the hormones? Some people go into menopause in their forties and I'm starting to anecdotally see a lot of thinner women going in earlier. They just don't have the estrogen stores to kind of bolster the, the ovaries and, and um, their reproductive system. So when I'm looking at people building muscle in their 40s and 50s, it's again, we go back to basics, but it can be a little bit more challenging. And quite honestly, um, in the last two years, I was actually talking to Dr. Lyons about this recently. I've noticed a, a tremendous muscle loss. And it, I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, lowering amounts of testosterone made in my body. And, you know, people can, this is very uh, controversial, I would say within that the middle-aged women brigade that I hang out with, some people are very open and receptive to hormonal replacement therapy. Others are not. I can tell you at the stage of life I'm in, uh, it's definitely a huge consideration and definitely something I talk to women about that they may be in a position um, if they don't have a contraindication to consider hormonal replacement therapy. And that could consist of progesterone and estradiol and testosterone, depending on the individual, and then looking at peptide therapy and other things that can be hugely helpful. So I think it gets a little bit more nuanced. It's, it's almost like cycling women have their own challenges and you know middle-aged women have their own challenges, but it is not at all impossible to build muscle at both sets of life stages. You just have to be savvy and you have to you know work with people, be exposed to people that understand the nuances and differences between, you know, younger women and, you know, middle-aged women. It kind of sounds to me like what you're saying, because my next question was going to be, what are some of the differences in how you approach fasting when you're in your twenties and thirties mm -hmm. versus, you know, forties, fifties, sixties, but it kind of sounds like what you're saying as you get older and some of these hormones start bottoming out that it might actually be harder to fast. And I would have thought the opposite, but 
can you, maybe I'm going wrong here, but it just seems- No, 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 no. Yeah. No, it, it, it's very nuanced. And so I have plenty of women in their forties that can fast effortlessly and easily because they've dialed in on stress because they're okay. sleeping well, because they're not doing the wrong types of exercise because their hormones are balanced. They're not having crazy cravings. I always say cravings are a sign that your body is not getting something that it needs. And I do feel that menopause, like women in menopause, I don't want to make the analogy. We're more like men, but we don't have as much fluctuation in our estradiol and our testosterone and our estrogen as we did before, excuse me, progesterone. And so I think it's a little bit easier for uh, menopausal women to, to fast because they don't have to worry about their period, uh, kind of, of, you know, leaving or, or, you know, cessation. And so that's always a concern. I tell women that are in their twenties, thirties, and early forties, if your period stops and you're not pregnant and you're fasting, it might be a sign that your body is telling you, like, I use that as a barometer. So when we think about blood pressure and pulse and respirations and temperature, our menstrual cycle is a barometer of how well we're taking care of our bodies. And I'm going to say that again. So this is one of those differentiators about cycling versus non-cycling women. Our menstrual cycle is one of the best ways of getting a sense of what our body's perception is of our lifestyle. So when you're no longer getting your cycle, it makes things a little easier. It's like one less variable. The, the trade-off is that women that are middle-aged don't respond to stress as well. When I think about the things I could do in my twenties, when I was in medical training and not getting enough sleep and gosh, I would stay up studying until three or four o'clock in the morning. I get up at six, I go to the hospital. I mean, I could do that effortlessly. I could not do that now. I'd be a hot mess. So we can handle stress differently when we're younger than we can when we're older. And I guess the trade-off is that for every person who's listening, who's curious about fasting, it's all a big experiment. I could take 10 women of the same age group, irrespective, younger, older, and they would all respond differently. So we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be forthright about what's working or is not working. If your hair's all falling out, if you can't sleep, if you're really anxious, if you're binging when you break your fat, you know, breaking your fast, um, if you have no energy to take a walk with your dog, let alone exercise, um, if you're craving crap and garbage, it's a sign that something is not working. And so I always say, pull the fasting piece out to see how your body responds. And I think much to your point from earlier, there are so many people who want to make fasting like the thing that's going to fix them, that they will oftentimes push it way too hard instead of giving their body ample time to kind of acquiesce to this new strategy. There are people that want to, that want to force it. And I always say nothing in our lives is well served when we force it really, it should work easily or it's not meant to work. And so I think you just have to be really honest with yourself, just recognizing that depending on what life stage you're in, you may have to look at, you may have to try a different strategy. So let me just reiterate what I just said. Younger women, your period is a barometer of how, um, what your body perceives your lifestyle is like, you know, older women, middle-aged women. I feel like every time I say older women, I'm like, that's not me, but I am middle-aged. So when we're talking about, you know, women in their forties and fifties, we really have to say, like, if you don't dial in on like the stress and the sleep piece, you're not going to have success. I tell people all the time, if I cannot get you to sleep through the night, I cannot get you to lose weight. And that's generally what people are attracted to with fasting. They want to lose weight. They want it to be effective. And I'm like, okay, let's get the basics. Like the foundational principles need, it's kind of like building a house. You have to have, you know, the foundation has to be strong. Otherwise the house will fall apart. Mm -hmm. I love that you really reiterated two kind of big things here. One being that this, your cycle is a very important message mm -hmm. that your body is sending to you because I do get a lot of, you know, women in their twenties and even early thirties who are like very hard charging athletes mm -hmm. who kind of have this mentality of like, well, I'm not trying to get pregnant right now. So I don't really care right. if my cycle. And it's like, that's not what it's about. It's not right. that we're saying you need to be able to get pregnant at any moment. It's that your body is giving you a very clear signal mm -hmm. that it's something isn't working. Something mm -hmm. is, is overly stressed. Something is being overly taxed and your body doesn't feel like it can function the way it is meant to function. And that's mm -hmm. what it's telling you. Um, so I think that's important. And then also the point that you're saying about, you know, you shouldn't have to force any of these things and l just listening to your body and, and paying attention to that and honoring it and respecting mm -hmm. it. Because so often we just think if we just keep pushing, if we just mm -hmm. keep pushing through, it's going to work. Um, instead of just taking the time to kind of step back and listen and mm -hmm. pay attention to those signals. And I think that's so important. And it leads into kind of the mental aspect that you did touch on earlier, but I wanted you to kind of maybe expand on it a little bit because you did say that another 
group that should either maybe not look at fasting as a tool or at the very least make sure that you're bringing in um, really suitable um, help and support mm -hmm. in terms of monitoring and paying attention to your mental and your physical health or mm -hmm. people who come from kind of dysfunctional um, mm -hmm. relationships with food and things like that. And it's one thing for someone to say, I was um, clinically anorexic and I went to a hospital for it and I had all this you know, mm -hmm. support and I'm working through it or people who maybe more clearly identify as having disordered eating. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know that there are way more women and men out there who have disordered attitudes towards mm -hmm. eating that will never be, you know, classified as such, mm -hmm. or will never maybe even necessarily recognize it in themselves. And that even people who have spent a lot of their life um, being, having quite healthy attitudes can go through periods of unhealthy mm -hmm. attitudes. And a lot of things, you know, I have a bodybuilding background, so I know firsthand how crazy people can get about mm -hmm. the types of food they eat and the way they look at their bodies. Um, and I think that oftentimes things like fasting, you know, mm -hmm. super strict, um, res restrictive diets can be put in place as a sort of um, excuse for dis disordered eating, right? It doesn't mean that it always is. It just means that it can be. Mm -hmm. um, so how do the vast majority of us who maybe are thinking, yeah, you know, sometimes maybe I'm a little hard on myself or sometimes I'm a little too anal about what I eat, but I'm fine. I'm, you know, it's fine. How do we determine whether this is something that is going to impact us negatively, um, create increased dysfunctional attitudes? Like how do we know what's sort of safe or good or how to dip our toes into these things? No, that's such a great question. I'm so glad that you're addressing this um, publicly because I see so much of this. I see a lot of people that hide their eating disorder in their fasting. There's even a, a very well-known fit pro. Well, I'm not going to name names because that's not who I am. And uh, the behavior that I see on social media, I follow her just out of curiosity because I think she's representative of a lot of people that are out there that kind of hide, you know, they, they, they think if I, if I embrace fasting, then I can justify not eating, you know, and I can wear, you know, a big metal, but you know, you can see their arms are very thin. They look very emaciated. So, you know, if you are prone to those tendencies, if you're particularly hard on yourself, you know, really thinking about the type a personality, uh, which generally aligns itself with anorexia. So, than uh, bulimia and disorder first. And it's really being honest about, do you have a healthy relationship with food? If the answer is no, then I would get help before I would think about adding in something that could stress you, overtax you. Um, you know, the comparisonitis that we see on social media, the FOMO is so destructive. You know, I'm almost grateful that I'm at the life stage I am because I, I largely spent all of my 20s into my early 30s not having social media and not having that exposure. And I just wonder, I, I really, I genuinely feel for people that grew up that are younger than me, because I can just imagine the degree of, you know, self-loathing behavior when people look at a very obviously Photoshopped photo or individuals that are using a hundred filters, uh, that, you know, that's not real. Like if you met that person in real life, they wouldn't look that way. But when it comes to fasting, I think we just have to be honest and say, you know, this is a social experiment. This may or may not work for me. I'll use a really good example. I had an opportunity to connect with uh, Dr. David Perlmutter earlier this year, and we talked a lot about this very primitive part of our brain, the amygdala, and how you know when we're stressed, it can override the prefrontal cortex, which allows us to have kind of organized, decisive decision making. And we've seen a lot of this uh, in the pandemic and the ensuing uh, nonsense that's gone on with that but it also plays a part in fasting. Mm -hmm. And so for many, many people not eating, when they start eating again, their brain is, is kind of hardwired to have the scarcity mindset of, oh my God, I don't know when I'm getting food again. So I'm going to overeat because I'm not sure when I'm getting food again. Now, if that were to happen to someone once, I would say, okay, maybe what you need to do is dial back on your fasting time. Maybe instead of 16 hours, you do 15 or 14, or maybe you just have three meals you know, in a 12 hour period of time. But if it's happening consistently, that could be a sign that your body just is not in the right emotional state. Or if you have heightened anxiety, I just got a message this morning uh, from a young woman who was like, every time I fast longer than 12 hours, I get very anxious. Now that to me speaks to the fact there's some huge emotional component. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with this person. It could honestly be 
her body's not in a position where she's really optimized to fast. And so, you know, I think on many, many levels, if you have a disordered relationship with food or a history of that, being really honest, like, are you tempting fate? If you're in recovery, are you tempting fate doing that without working with your counselor, psychologist, psychiatrist, whomever your mental health specialist very closely to make sure that you're in the right mindset. And I do think there are lots of other people who just have these kind of bizarre relationships with food. I know I grew up with a mother that was very focused on how I looked and what I looked like. And um, it, that definitely rubs off on your children. So you might've had a mom or maybe had a relationship with your dad and he was overly preoccupied with your weight. And so you view yourself with this very narrow lens. And so I think it's really, really important that you're just aware, pardon me, you're aware of your shit. We all have stuff that impacts our behavior, that impacts the way we view our relationship with food and just being very aware of it. Like I recognize, I'll give you a good example. The point I'm trying to make is that even healthy people can have times like I didn't binge during the pandemic. I didn't drink excessively. In fact, I drank very little, but I was starting to notice that my behavior, I was eating more protein bars instead of eating a real meal. And I was like, I need to stop this behavior. So half of half of the battle is just recognizing if you're doing things that end ultimately are not serving you well, and just being honest with yourself. And, and the piece about bioindividuality is really needs to be overemphasized that you will have your best friend, your sister, maybe they look to you, you're able to fast, you know, when you're not pregnant, you know, able to fast, you know, effortlessly, and then maybe you struggle and that is okay. Like we need to give ourselves permission and grace to understand that some things aren't serving us right now. And that is totally okay. Yeah. I love that. Okay. We're almost coming up to the end. I do have one kind of quick, and this is just like a pragmatic point um, mm-hmm. that I'd love for you to address. Because again, I think, like you said, bioindividuality, people are going to do it a little differently. Mm-hmm. Some people will do 12 hour daily fast. Some people will do one or two a week. That's a six hour compressed eating window. Yep. Some people will go a full day once a week without eating, whatever. Um, but I think one thing that that is a big misconception in the mainstream for most people around fasting is that people think fasting means skipping a meal and thus subsequently eating less over time, Mm -hmm. which is not necessarily, and I would say, correct me if I'm wrong, not even usually Mm -hmm. what we're trying to do. It's more about compressing the eating window so that your body can shift to burning, like you said, your endogenous fat, um, and it can shift to, you know, a bit more of the rest and digest and not be constantly kind of taking in exogenous calories and dealing with those. So is that something that you would say is pretty like an accurate, um, like rule of thumb for women who are getting started again to get their head around? This is not about you. In most cases, Mm -hmm. eating less, cutting out a meal. You never get to have breakfast again. It's more about, you know, just sort of paying attention to these, the cravings, the eating window, the time that you have to digest your food and things like that. No. And I think, you know, it's something that we didn't touch on, but a lot of these intrinsic benefits, um, with fasting, it's like all this beautiful, uh, physiology that happens, you know, we tap into something called autophagy, which is this waste and recycling process And that is really only magnified when we're not eating, when our body is not focused on digesting all this food. So that's one huge benefit. You know, we think about spikes in human growth hormone. We think about the counter-regulatory hormones like norepinephrine that, you know, will increase when we're in a fasted state, which helps suppress hunger, which is one of the, the kind of misnomers. People think, oh, you know, you're just kind of effortlessly fasting. Well, your body actually is so smart and so attuned to what's going on. We know it improves biophysical markers. We know that, you know, lowered fasting insulin um, helps with the release of a particular type of ketone body, this beta hydroxybutyrate, which crosses the blood brain barrier and gives us all this intrinsic energy. So, you know, heightened sense of energy, heightened cognition, and that's all because you're fasted. So in this fasted state, you have all of these incredible benefits And I always tell people, I'm like, listen, um, you know, give it uh, four to six weeks and see how you feel. What I find is people feel so darn good, irrespective of the scale that they want to continue doing it. And I just remind people, if we're looking at like ANSA, this is the way our bodies are designed to perform best. They are not designed to be eating mini meals and snacks and, you know, dealing with um, this constant onslaught of calories and food and food like substances for that matter that we're consuming throughout the day. We know that that is incredibly detrimental. It's absolutely contributing to the degree of 
metabolic disease and, and obesity that we're seeing not only in the United States, but all Westernized nations. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I'll let you go. I don't want to keep you all day. You've given us so much information and we'll get more from your book when it comes out. So very excited about that. You'll have to keep us posted on the exact uh, launch date of your book. Um, but I, I just think that the key things that I, I'd love for people to take away from this, and I think you would agree with me when I say that, again, fasting is, it can be absolutely life-changing for people, mm -hmm. but ultimately it is a tool. It's a right. tool. It's not who you are. It's not how you have to identify and it's not how you have to be all the time. It's, it's a tool that will take some, some work on your mm -hmm. end to implement and understand how it works with your body. Um, but it's not something to necessarily, um, you know, get stressed out over or feel like it has to be once you started it, you have to continue it. It's going to look different for everyone. Um, and I think that that's an important nuanced conversation to have. And I'm glad that you can put that out there for women who, again, sometimes we aren't getting the right information or um, we're not getting the support. We're not getting the context. And so I think that um, it's really important that you're doing the work that you're doing. So people do have a bit more resources and context. And I really appreciate you sharing that with us today, because I think this is going to be helpful and I'll be able to direct all of my lady friends and clients who are coming to me and giving me really frustrating feedback on fasting now, I can say, just listen to this podcast, listen to Cynthia, like she knows what's going on. So thank you so much for, for your, your time today and for putting this book together. It's, it's yeah. important. No, I, I agree. I feel like, um, there's a lot of fasting literature that's out there, a lot of resources, but we as women need a book dedicated to us and really kind of celebrates and embraces our unique individuality and then also kind of starts the conversation of, you know, how, why and how do we need to fast differently than our male counterparts mm -hmm. and to be able to do it safely. I think, you know, there are so many benefits from fasting, but it's all about strategies to make it sustainable and, and to make, to able to embrace, like, I know, you know, maybe someone is trying to conceive, just got pregnant and they're going to breastfeed. And so maybe there's two years in their life that they're not going to fast and it's totally okay. You can make up for lost time. You can't you know, change all that amazing bonding time that you're going to have with your baby, um, both in utero and uh, when they're when they're born. So delighted to have been a part of your podcast today. Thank you so much. And good luck with uh, the move and Montana. Um, that's going to be very exciting. Tell tell listeners where they can go. Um, can anyone sort of work with you individually at this point or is it how does that work? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, I was taking one-on-ones, but I stopped uh, because of writing the book and the book launch, which is, uh, as you know, is is a feels like it's a full time. It'll feel like a full time job. So I I do work with clients in group formats. I've got a couple group programs. One is IF forty five. We'll be enrolling in July. Um, I do a clean in fourteen, which is a program that's just designed to clean up people's lifestyle from our you know, just the amount of toxins we're exposed to. And then I have another kind of smaller signature program called Holistic Blueprint. I do, however, have another advanced practice nurse on my team, Tessa. She is taking one-on-ones um, and she's amazing. So that's definitely, if people are looking to deep dive and want to work one-on-one, -on -one, um, she does diagnostic testing. We work with the GI map, the Dutch test, um, the MRT, which is a food sensitivity test amongst a myriad of other tools that are out there along with intermittent fasting, here we go with the barking dog. Oh, that's, um, that's a science. Yes. <laughs> Time to get moving. Yeah, the, um, that and, you know, I'm on Everyday Wellness is my podcast. I get to interview some pretty incredible humans. And hopefully once you get settled after your baby, I can bring you on as well. Yeah, for sure. All right, Cynthia, thank you so much for your time. Um, thanks to your pot for being patient. And uh, we'll, we'll do this again sometime soon. Sounds good. That's it for today, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to Cynthia for taking time to educate us as always. And thank you to our show sponsor, Paleo Valley. Love these guys. I'm eating their snacks every day. Um, I wouldn't talk about them if I wasn't. So go check them out. My favorite things right now, they have a ton of products and supplements and we'll get more into that um, as the months progress. But right now I'm mostly enjoying their 100% grass-fed and fermented beef sticks and their superfood bars. Um, the beef sticks are kind of cool because they 
use a different process to make them shelf stable and uh, jerky by fermenting them instead of using um, citric acid, which is often what is used um, to kind of process things like um, beef jerky. I had no idea. I learned this actually talking to the founder of Paleo Valley that most citric acid, I assumed it's like, okay, that's from like citrus. It's probably that's healthy, right? But it's actually often created using GMO corn um, and can be problematic to people who have really, uh, or have sensitivities, right? And it's just not the best ingredient. So the fact that they do this in like a really healthy, natural way using these old world methods is pretty cool. They've got a couple different flavors of the beef sticks. They have turkey um, beef, well, turkey sticks, I suppose, as well. Um, but the beef ones are my favorite. And they've got original jalapeno summer sausage, garlic summer sausage, and my favorite teriyaki. They all have zero grams of sugar, except, of course, for the teriyaki, my favorite, sweet tooth over here. It has two grams of sugar from organic honey. Um, but they're great protein, super easy to take everywhere, good for kids, full of gut friendly probiotics. I mean, it's an ideal snack. So check them out. You can go to paleovalley.com, use the code MMR to save 15% on anything you buy. If you try this stuff out, give me some feedback. Let me know what you like, maybe what you didn't like, whatever. Um, I'm open to hearing everyone's opinions on everything. That's what I'm here for. All right, that's it for this week. I hope you have an awesome rest of your day and join me next Tuesday for another awesome interview.